Hi, I'm Bob Crane, known to some people who watch television as a captured World War II pilot on Hogan's Heroes. I don't get a chance to do much flying in real life, so occasionally I like to come out to an air base, shoot the breeze with the professionals. <laughs> this trip was a complete bust. A real flame out. The whole place is deserted. Nobody. Nothing. This used to be the home of the Air National Guard. A busy place too, especially on weekends. <laughs> now look at it. What happened is this outfit went to war, like a lot of other Air National Guard outfits all over the country. These guys look familiar? They ought to. You've seen them before. Local bank, the grocery store, at the hospital, classroom, the courtroom, maybe in your own home. At the moment, these men are out fulfilling military obligations at bases all over the globe. But they're only temporary warriors, permanent citizens. They're your friends, friends and neighbors, the people you know. January 25th, 1968. The President mobilizes 11 Air National Guard squadrons with more than 9,000 men. International developments have suddenly increased the nation's total requirements for air power. The Air Guard is being called upon for help. There was nothing unusual. In every war in our history, citizens have been asked to abandon their peacetime activities and take up arms. This is one of the responsibilities of citizenship. But rarely have men responded with greater speed and made the transition more smoothly. In fact, these citizen airmen, or ones like them, have left their homes and jobs four times in the past 20 years to serve in times of international emergencies. This is what most Air Guardsmen expect after their call and what is expected of them. Within 24 hours, more than 99.5% of the men in the mobilized units report for duty. While they're fully trained and ready for combat the moment they're called up, these men still take advantage of the interval between call-up and deployment to sharpen those skills. Rehearse those procedures and practice those exercises, which may be of the greatest value to them wherever they're sent, to Vietnam, South Korea, Japan. As the deployment date approaches, certain decisions have to be made. A nice problem for a computer. Those units alerted for overseas can take along only about one half of their personnel. But many more than that have volunteered to go. Which ones will be chosen? Finally, the date arrives. The selected units are scheduled to depart at intervals of about two weeks. The first to go is the 120th Tactical Fighter Squadron at Buckley Field, Denver, Colorado. 
The equipment goes first. Spare engines to replace any which might wear out or be destroyed. Ground vehicles for use on the flight line. Other equipment and tools to repair and, if necessary, rebuild engines or aircraft. The ground personnel are a vital part of the outfit. They'll have to be set up and waiting at the first stop to service the incoming fighter planes. So they ride with the equipment. The C-141 star lifters, 15 tons of men and equipment in each of the huge aircraft. The fighter pilots get their briefing from their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cherry. The upcoming flight will be made in three hops, Hawaii, Guam, and Vietnam, with frequent in-flight refuelings on the long hops. Technically, the exact destination is still classified. Not until they arrive in South Vietnam will their exact destination be made public. But their families have a pretty good idea where these men are headed. Later, these same goodbyes are repeated by other guard units at Sioux City, Albuquerque, Niagara Falls, Columbus, Ohio, Little Rock, Reno, Wichita. But don't get the impression that all the men are going in units to the Far East. Actually, more than half the guardsmen mobilized are filling individual assignments at some 86 flying bases at home and abroad. For some men, this is the third time they've said goodbye and gone off to war, but it doesn't get any easier with repetition. No one knows how much longer his luck will hold. A day, a week, a month, a year. Some of these citizens may find out the hard way. It's the Strategic Air Command's flying service stations that make it possible for the fighter pilots to ferry their own planes across the thousands of miles of ocean. Once they're airborne, each of the KC-135 tankers quickly gathers up and takes under its wings some five or six of the fighter planes and mothers them the rest of the way across the Pacific. In-flight refueling is a delicate and precise operation. Yet because of the relatively short range of fighters, it must be repeated several times by each pilot in order to span the Pacific. The first stop for all units is Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. The ground crews, which were sent ahead, are ready and waiting to service the F-100s for the second leg of the journey. It's a very short stopover, though. The next morning, the tankers and the C-141s lead the way into the air again. The F-100s follow, rendezvous with their tankers, and the parade is on again. The long hours in the cramped fighter cockpits are nerve-grinding, but it's not the kind of parade that anyone wants to drop out of. Finally, the 120th arrives at its designated base in Vietnam, Phan Rang. On hand to greet the incoming pilots are the base commander and General William Momeyer, then commander of all Air Force units in Vietnam. It's been a textbook movement. The 120th has arrived on schedule three days after leaving Denver with all 20 planes intact, ready for action. The same record is achieved by Iowa's 174th Tactical Fighter Squadron. It flies into Phuket two weeks later. Two other guard units, one from Albuquerque, the other from Niagara Falls, flew into Tuihua. Altogether, these four squadrons ferry 80 short-range fighter planes across 12,000 miles of open ocean, with all but four planes making the trip on schedule. Not bad for citizens turned airmen. But getting here is only the beginning. Their mission is to assist the active air force in supporting the American and South Vietnamese ground forces. 
In some places, there's skepticism about their ability to perform, but not for long. Within a few days of arrival, after a short period of theater indoctrination, each squadron is ready for action. Since the Coloradians are the first to arrive, they're the first to see action. Before long, each squadron is averaging more than 20 combat missions a day. The skills learned in other wars are coming in very handy in this one. There are no more doubts about the abilities of these units, but another thing that makes these Air Guardsmen unique is that all of the pilots, with one or two exceptions, have the skill and experience to qualify as flight leaders. They and the 355th, also at Phuket, which is composed largely of Air Guard personnel from other mobilized units, are the equal of any tactical fighter squadron in Vietnam. Their secret? It's partly superb maintenance provided by skilled ground personnel under the expert supervision of such experienced NCOs as Crew Chief Charles Moore of the Colorado Air National Guard. As far as I'm concerned, we're the best. I mean, most of us got more than five or six years in the outfit. I'd say we average, most of the technician average about 10 to 15 years experience. But it's also first class leadership provided by such experienced pilots as Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Young, the CO of the Sioux City, Iowa Air National Guard. These angles on uh, rocket passes. Now one of the uh, pilots here in 416, got a ricochet off, off one, of his own, one of his own rockets. So watch your angles on those, and ranges. Your angles, wait, there's no minimum angle on rockets, actually. But I'd advise you keep it up to you. You do get down to a low angle, keep your range out there where you can clear that impact area real good so you won't catch a ricochet off your rocket. But even the constant pressure of combat in the 12-hour workday, which is standard in Vietnam, still leave a little time for other things. Some serious, and some not so serious. There's no doubt about it, Vietnam is a long way from home. But there are ways to keep in touch. And for those who want their communication to be even more personal than a letter, there are means to provide that, too. Hi, son. Gosh, it seems ages since we last saw you. Tape facilities are available for use in both directions. All I can say is, honey, that I sure do miss you. You'll be interested to know that your brother Pete is back in school now and doing very well. Take care of yourself and the baby. And guess what? Judy has decided to take singing lessons. Can you imagine that? Home, of course, is at the back of everybody's mind in every war. This one is no exception. Okay, I want you to help me sing this song if you will, if you don't know it, fake it, okay? I wanna go home. I wanna go home. I wanna go home. Last night I went to sleep in Detroit City. And I dreamed about the Most of these Air Guardsmen volunteered to go to combat, and though they play the game in the song fest, not many want to go home before they finish the job they came here to do. The war in 
in Vietnam is really two wars, one being fought with bombs and bullets, and one with hands and hearts. The Air Guard units are actively engaged in both wars. These men of the 174th and the 355th at Phu Cat devote their free time in helping the villagers of nearby Phung Don rebuild the homes destroyed by the rockets and mortars of the Viet Cong. Other Air Guardsmen, such as flight surgeons, Major Thurman Dabbs, Major Carl Shushi, spend as much time as possible trying to repair the damage war always brings to the weak and helpless. Uh, Dr. Shushi, this is uh, the little boy that I was telling you about the other day. About two weeks ago, we picked him up in the uh, MedCap clinic at Song Cal. We've been able to get rid of uh, three of the parasites, but I'm still having uh, considerable difficulty with his heart and lungs. Okay, let's listen to him. Whatever the Air Guardsmen do in their spare time, however, the reason for being in Vietnam is to support the Allied ground forces in their battles with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Averaging more than 20 missions a day, it isn't long before the 120th at Van Rang, the first of the Air Guard squadrons to begin fighting, approaches an important milestone, its 1,000th mission. This mission is a two-plane strike against an enemy unit opposing an American military force in the South. Leading the mission is Major John L. France, in civilian life, a practicing attorney in Denver. First, he gets a weather briefing. As you go down along the coast, there are a few isolated rain showers and thunder showers. Uh, there's one fairly good size one still at the 20,000 feet dissipating in the Guam Tau area. Uh, scattered stratus running two to four eighths at up around 1,000 to 1,500 feet. Uh, weather generally through the forecast area is expected to get uh, a deck of strata Q at around 1,500 feet. Then comes an intelligence briefing where he learns everything known about the combat situation in the target area. In the uh, Da Nang area, we have uh, reported uh, contacts to the north, to the west, to the south, all around the area. Uh, the villagers report uh, considerable numbers of uh, VC moving into that area and working farther south in two core. Dark Peck, again, quiet for a change. Uh, no rockets, no mortars. Uh, same way with Dark Toe, Contum, and Play Coup. Uh, moving farther down, Ban Me Too, still quiet. Tuiwa, some action to the west. Uh, troops in contact out here. Uh, we haven't uh, any results of what's happened out there, but uh, apparently we're on the winning edge of it. Finally, France briefs his wingman, Major William Newins, on his plan for their mission. To uh, free your pattern, uh, start getting, getting your spacing as we're picking up the information from the forward air controller. When I'm 180 degrees out, I'll uh, call you and uh, start a roll in. You can make your 360 and or any way you can get around to get reciprocal from me so that I'll be going by, uh, hopefully with a left break, and uh, you can lay a bomb in 30 seconds from the other direction after I've passed and make a left break, and then we'll be in the butterfly pattern and we'll keep it going. However, not even the most careful planning and attention to detail can remove all chance of unforeseen developments. The unexpected is almost routine on these missions, so they're never boring. Flying over Vietnam is much the same as flying over the United States. Clouds have the same soft unreality. The land unrolls in the same pattern of rivers and fields and forests, but 
there is a difference. You're very much aware that down below a war is going on, that men are fighting and dying. Those hills and forests are not as innocent as they seem. Nearing the target, they pick up the voice of the forward air controller in his observation plane above the area. Okay, what's your position, please? Mission accomplished. Return to base. 1,000 missions. That's only a beginning, of course. Before they complete their tours in Vietnam, each Air Guard squadron will have multiplied that figure by six or seven. Still, it merits some sort of celebration. On every one of those missions, someone risked his life. John. Help me out? Yeah. Change the ground, really. Congratulations. Here's to 1,000. 1,000. Come on, I just went off the wagon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we good one? Yeah, a real good mission. One more. Always good in four cars. There's no doubt that some of these men are heroes. And for some of their work, there is only one word, heroic. They've been asked to do a job, a hot, sweaty, uncomfortable job for the most part. And they're doing it to the very best of their ability. When the call came, they responded willingly, many at great personal sacrifice because they recognize their obligations as Air Guardsmen and American citizens. Their pride in their units and their devotion to duty are apparent in everything they do. When these men packed up their gear and flew off to war, they left some pretty big gaps in the economic and social life of their community. When they return to fill these gaps, they'll bring with them the same good sense 
the same dedication to duty, the same resourcefulness, the same sense of responsibility which makes them such valuable members of our armed forces. Low angle, keep your range out there where you can clear that impact area real good so you won't catch a ricochet off your rock. So that I'll be going by, uh, hopefully with a left break, and uh, you can lay a bomb in 30 seconds from the other direction. After I've passed, we'll make a left break, and then we'll be in the butterfly pattern, and we'll keep it going just like that. Dr. Tabs, I don't find anything that you haven't already found, and I think the treatment that you've got program will do the job. All right, sir, we'll, uh, we'll keep on with that then, and uh, I'll let you know how we get along. Fine. As far as I'm concerned, we're the best. I mean, most of us got more than five or six years in the outfit. I say we average, most of the technician average about 10 to 15 years experience. Why shouldn't they be the best? What else would you expect of your friends and neighbors? people you know.